Okay, welcome everybody again, and it's fantastic to see you. It's Carol Pasternak, the Monarch Crusader, reporting to you from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, where it got up to a balmy 14 degrees today with tons of sunshine. And for my American friends, that's 58 degrees. And we are starting to see flies, okay? If you see a couple of flies, how far can monarchs be behind? And I just got a report from Steve Parr in Chatham that he saw a morning cloak today. So put your hand up, Steve. Steve saw a morning cloak today, so the butterflies are coming. So this is how this meeting is going to work. Anareg is going to tell us a little bit about his work. And then, because it's my meeting, I am the first one who gets to ask him the questions that I want to ask. Uh, then you'll have some time for questions. And how will I know that you have a question? You are going to not put your hand up like this. You are going to scroll down to the bottom. And then you're going to take your cursor and put it on reactions. You click on reactions and you will see raise hand. Good job. We're practicing. It's the people who have been here know the, the, uh, the routine. So you put up your hand and it, it stays there. It will not go away. So if I'm going to need you to lower it. If you think you have a question, then it got answered. Lower your hand again. Okay, so we're going to lower our hand. And then we're going to try other reactions. So click reaction. And if Anareg says something particularly astute that you really, you know, or one of the people in the audience, because I'll tell you about that, that you may say something that's applaud worthy, you can applaud. So you can put your applaud sign on. Okay, we got Irene and Bev that tried the applaud sign. This is very good. Now, if the, you click on chat, this meeting is going to be really fun like all other meetings because you are going to be allowed to pass notes in class. So let's say um, uh, Jim and Sheila know Karen McCurdy and she was not, she just jumped in right this minute. Okay, you can click on Karen McCurdy and then you can um, have a personal private chat with her. You have to be really careful with this that you're not chatting with everybody, okay? It's really tricky, so make sure you're chatting with the right person and you can pass notes in class about anything that you like that's going to be fun. And then we're going to say goodbye. Uh, but before we say goodbye, we're going to have announcements. So if you run a particular group, whether it's an online group or you have any kind of insect group, whatever kind of group you have that you want to invite everybody else to, or if you have an event coming up, uh, you can talk about that. And, and you've got like two sentences to do that. Same thing for questions. The question should be able to be asked in about two sentences. And that way we have time for everybody. And another thing for two sentences at the end is if you have some achievement that you have done, like you got the, your, your local uh, uh, Boy Scout group to plant a butterfly garden at the school, if you have some achievement, because part of the purpose of all of this is to inspire each other to do more and more for monarchs. So if you've got some achievement, we, uh, before we go, we want uh, you to tell us about that. Um, and then we say goodbye to Anarag. He can stay after that if he wants. But then we can really open, unmute everybody and chat amongst ourselves and just like have a conversation. Uh, so for the people who I just let in, you can see my background and you can try to figure out how the heck I got that shot and maybe we'll talk about it later. So I am going to let the last of the people in and then I'm going to introduce, well, there won't be any last, I'm going to introduce Anreg and um, then he can take it from there. Okay. Anreg Agrawal has a master's degree in conservation biology and his PhD in population biology. In 2000, he started as an assistant professor at my alma mater, the University of Toronto. Since 2004, he has been a professor at Cornell University, where he teaches ecology and biodiversity, field biology, and chemical interactions. Anurag lectures widely to professionals 
and the public, and he has won the highest honors from several academic societies. Among his areas of research is the interactions between wild plants and their insect pests, their co-evolution and the entire monarch life cycle, hence his book, Monarchs and Milkweed. Okay, put your physical hand up if you've ever heard of this book. Okay, put keep your physical <laughs> hand up if you if you own the book. Okay, and then keep your physical hand up if you've actually read the book. Okay, we have a few readers here. Okay, and here is his passion. Integrating natural history, coming up with bold scientific theories and interacting with diverse scientists from students to citizen scientists. And that is us. So he gets to talk to us today and we got get to talk to him. And this is a win for everybody. Take it away, Anurag. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Carol. It's a pleasure to be here and um, nice to see um, some old friends and folks that I've corresponded with but never met and, and, and new friends, so um, yeah. As Carol mentioned, I've got about uh, 14 slides and I just, you know, sort of give you a little bit of background, some of the things I'm thinking about currently, and then hopefully we spend most of the time uh, chatting and uh, discussing questions, etc. cetera. Um, that seemed good. So can I share my screen, Carol? Geez, I hope like, so. We should have practiced see. that in the practice. Uh, let's see, perfect. Um, so I would say, you know, um, an undergraduate student at Cornell took this image. It's of a monarch behind a milkweed leaf as at sunset. Um, but you know, I spend my time as a faculty member and sort of um, you know bouncing between, I'd say, a few different things. At least as it relates to monarchs and milkweed. And I would say that on the one hand, I am involved in studying the basic biology of these species, following my nose as I observe things, um, testing theories that scientists have erected. Uh, you know. Are monarchs and milkweeds a good example of particular constructs, theoretical constru constructs uh, relating to biodiversity or how species interact? But I also spend time trying to understand some of the most important issues for monarch conservation. And um, about 10 years ago, that started um, including what I'll call socio-political aspects. Um, and lastly, as, as Carol, you kind of mentioned, communicating uh, with and learning from students and non-scientific audiences has been a real um, a real pleasure, and it's kind of interesting how it's informed my own research and teaching to uh, interact with people outside of the academy, as we sometimes call it. Um, one of my messages for you today, or themes to, for you today, and um, I guess this won't be a surprise to any of you, but um, is you know science seeks to be objective. Um, science and scientists like myself, but we often fail. And, and, and I don't mean that, you know, we often fail at being objective because we have agendas or we're trying to, you know, uh, but by its very nature, the scientific enterprise is one of incomplete and imperfect information. And that's what keeps us in business, right? We sort of um, uh, need to do more to understand phenomenon, but, um, if you take something you know, like the listing decision that the Fish and Wildlife Service just concluded, um, you know, there were prominent monarch biologists, conservation biologists like Chip Taylor that were opposed to the listing of the monarch. And there were others um, who know just as much or have access to the same information, love monarchs just as much that were highly supportive of listing of, of, of monarchs under the Endangered Species Act. And so, I just give that as one example, and we'll talk about some others as we move through. Um, but um, that's just the way, and I think it, in some ways it's it's really important in the sense that it allows science to progress, to have debate and disagreement, um, especially when we have something like um, a life cycle of an organism that travels as far as it does and eats as uh, many different plant species and as many milkweeds and et cetera as it does that um, uh, there would be uh, incomplete or imperfect information. 
So uh, I often like to start these uh, talks just by reminding folks that um, milkweeds are the genus Asclepius, which are the essentially the only food for the monarch butterfly, uh, are a highly diverse group of plants. There are 140 species uh, in, the, in the genus Asclepius, and they're essentially, you know, 85% of them are North American, Mexico to Canada. Um, and then there's a precious few species that exist in South America, tropic. Milkweed is not a tropical genus. It's really a temperate, uh, a temperate group of plant. Um, although there are about a 250 closely related, very similar looking species in Africa um, that we typically call Gomphocarpus, but you'd have difficulty telling some of those, well, this is in fact a Gomphocarpus up here on the upper right, have difficulty telling some of those apart from, um, from our milkweeds. But one of the, we, I, I don't really study the flowers, but I like to show this image because uh, milkweeds have a very distinctive floral form that um, has been stretched and colored by natural selection in various ways, but it, they sort of maintain that, uh, that common form. And here's our common milkweed Asclepia syriaca, of course. Um, as most of you know, I think 90 some percent of the monarchs that make it to Mexico have completed their last generation feeding on the common milkweed. But uh, equally important in terms of dominance is uh, 80 some percent of the monarchs in their first generation as they're migrating back from Mexico into Texas and the Gulf states feed on Asclepius viridis shown here. And so it's a critically important host plant um, because essentially one entire generation is on Asclepius viridis before they come north to common milkweed. I promise not to bore you too much with details about concepts and theories, but since I said that half of my life, my scientific life is engaged with testing some of these ideas, I wanna just introduce you to the concept of co-evolution. Uh, I spent a lot of time in my book talking about co-evolution and it's sort of a special kind of evolution because what we have here is two very intimately involved organisms that are each imposing natural selection on each other. And the way I like to think about this is, look, the monarch only eats the milkweed. It is highly evolved to feed on and specialize to feed on this milkweed plant. As such, because it is eating the leaves, eating essentially the, some of the critical pieces of the milkweed plant, it imposes natural selection on the milkweed to defend itself. And in response, the milkweed has evolved defensive strategies, that sticky latex, that those cardiac glycosides uh, as a means to suppress or to prevent or to reduce the amount of damage that the monarchs impose. So that evolution in the plant now imposes natural selection on the monarch to evolve and improve its ability to exploit the plant. And uh, in a way this goes on and, and the key here in a, is reciprocity in coevolution. That's what makes coevolution a special form. Over time, we expect that the traits that the plants and the, in this case, the monarchs have will be escalating over time, evolving in response to each other, where at particular moments or particular populations, the monarch may be a bit on top or the milkweed may be a bit on top, but it, we expect that arms race as it's been analogized to, to continue on over time. Uh, some of the key players in the history of monarch milkweed co-evolutionary studies is, uh, includes Miriam Rothschild. She was a wild person. And probably if there was one uh, dead person I could meet, it would probably be her. Um, uh, she really uh, tested the classic idea from the late 1800s that um, many butterflies, but monarchs in particular, get their toxicity and the reason that that predators don't eat them is because they pack away the poisons that are in the plants they're eating, these toxic cardiac glycosides. And in just a year or two after Miriam, Miriam Rothschild did her work, of course, uh, Lincoln Brower, who will be familiar to most of you, did his classic studies that we uh, sometimes refer to now as Brower's Barking Blue Jays, because he showed that monarchs that had been feeding on milkweed in particular have toxins that quite repeatedly cause monarch, uh, blue jays to vomit after about 12 minutes having fed upon a monarch. 
Uh, Lincoln Brower, as you, you probably know, passed away a couple of years ago now. So we, it's up to us now that the legends of uh, uh, monarch milkweed coevolution and, and biology um, have, have passed on. I want to just very briefly touch on, you know, again, one of these kind of controversies or uh, issues of uh, unclarity, and that has to do with the role of latex in monarch milkweed interactions. Miriam Rothschild once wrote a, a, a publication where she said that monarchs drink latex like a cat laps up milk. And um, her notion from her studies was that in fact, these caterpillars benefit from uh, the latex and that they drink it. In some, in some of my own work, um, uh, I and others have shown and have sort of convinced ourselves that latex is a, a quite effective defense of the plant and that monarchs want nothing to do with it, but simply have to contend with it and get it out of the way. Um, so this is one of those situations where science and scientists seek to be objective, um, but probably we just don't have the complete story. Probably there's some truth to the fact that uh, the plant is defending itself quite effectively. 35% of monarchs die mired in latex. I mean, how could that possibly be beneficial to them? And yet it probably is the case that at least under, the, under some circumstances, monarchs do lap up that latex and utilize the toxins that are in there as a defense against themselves, uh, against their own, their, their predators like the birds. So I just bring this up as, you know, science is full of controversy or full of uh, back and forth. And that's one of the things that um, frustrates us sometimes because there aren't simple, clear answers, but it is also a uh, part of the process. Okay, so in my uh, scientific work, yes, I focus a fair bit on monarchs and milkweeds. Um, but, you know, one of the frustrating questions for me sometimes is that I get a lot of emails and questions about um, uh, how to rid milkweed of all the other insects that are on it. And um, as opposed, I'm always telling people, hey, don't get rid of those insects. They have just as much of a right to be there um, as, as the monarch does. And in fact, um, uh, with some careful observation and study, you can find tremendously beautiful and interesting biology um, it, going on with these insects. So they, they include the milkweed tussock moth. This is the, the very early larval stage, and this is the more familiar one. Uh, there are three species of aphids that suck the sap of um, uh, milkweed. Here's Mysocalus, here's Aphis asclepiatus, and the most familiar Aphis nerii. Three beetles that span the three big beetle families. We have a snouted weevil, a leaf beetle, the Labidomera, and the Cerambicid, or longhorn beetle, Tetraopes. Uh, there are other true bugs like Oncopeltis and Lygias that eat the seeds. Uh, even, a, even a fly that uh, mines between the layers of the leaf. So this is a leaf mining fly, pardon me, in the genus Illyriomyza. So quite interestingly, the, the milkweed insects have divvied up the plant and made niches for themselves in the different places. The, the larva of the cere this beetle here exclusively feeds on the roots. We have sap feeders, seed feeders, stem feeders. The, Rhizomatus' larva feeds only inside of the, the stem on the pith tissue, in addition to uh, the leaf feeders. So I've made my <laughs> a, a sort of um, scientific career by, by not only studying monarchs and milkweeds, but also by expanding the study of these other organisms. I'll just tell you, give you one slide on our current uh, most interesting research project. Um, and that has to do with asking the question as to whether the kind of coevolutionary arms race that occurs between monarchs and milkweeds can independently be going on with the other organisms that are attacking the milkweed. So yes, the monarch primarily eats leaves and gets up to eating floral buds and flowers sometimes. Uh, and then on the roots, we have the larva of tetraopes, the longhorn beetle. And then on the seeds, as I mentioned, we have Oncopeltis. So one of the things we're studying now is how different the defenses are in the seeds versus leaf and um, floral tissue versus the roots. 
and whether the organisms or these pests are co-evolving with the plant independently. In other words, there's an arms race between the roots and the root beetle, between the leaves and the leaf feeders and the seeds and the seed feeders. So that's just something that we're working on these days. I'll very quickly talk about um, some of the classic uh, work involved in finding the uh, monarch overwintering sites, at least finding them for uh, American and Canadian and, and European scientists. Of course, there were uh, native uh, Mexicans that certainly were aware of uh, jillions of overwintering monarchs um, uh, in Michoacan. Uh, beginning in the 1940s, though, uh, you know, really is around 1900, you know, the Comstocks of Cornell had written a book on entomology, and they wrote in that book, uh, well, we know that monarchs fly south every fall, uh, but we don't really know where they go or where they come from or where they how, when, you know, why they come back in the spring. And they, they speculated that there was an overwintering ground somewhere, but they didn't know where it was. Well, in 1940s, Nora and Fred Urquhart took up the challenge of trying to figure out uh, where they went in the winter and what they were doing. Uh, they developed a tagging scheme, which has been modified and is now used by Monarch Watch and others. Uh, but basically, the tagging scheme was meant as a means to follow where they go. And one of my favorite um, publications about monarchs to read is that their, their 1955 report, you know, five years or six years of data on what they had learned so far in 1955 about monarch migration. And the two really interesting things about it that I'll just share with you here is that they had uh, citizen scientists uh, throughout the US and, and uh, Southern Canada uh, collecting these tags, and they were typically found in the US because the monarchs were flying south, and they got mailed back. And, and so these were all of the tags that they had received. And so they developed this notion that perhaps monarchs were flying south in the fall, but somehow jumped over to California, which of course we know is an independent, largely independent population, and then somehow jumped back uh, in the spring. So of course that ended up being wrong, but in the scientific discourse, having spent 15 years or some so odd uh, studying it, this is the best they had come up with at that point. The other thing I'll just mention very quickly, a, a wonderful note from this 1955 report was that they reported in 1952, there were essentially no monarchs to be seen uh, throughout the America, the, throughout North America. They had citizen scientists, again, about 220 some or whatever, writing in letters and, what, and, and whatnot. And the population seems to have crashed in 1952. And we know not why. But I simply mentioned that because um, I think all of you know this, but the monarch is a very high fluctuation species in terms of its population. There's no question to me that its population is declining and in danger, but um, it is tremendously and historically a very high fluctuation species. All right, so uh, in 1975, with the help of uh, many, many, many citizen scientists, the the Urquhart team grew from a couple hundred to several thousand. They were writing, uh, when they suspected that they went to Mexico, they were putting uh, uh, articles in Mexico City newspapers and requesting help. And, um, and in 1975, the monarchs were discovered um, uh, uh, in the mountains of Michoacan. Um, this is one of the citizen scientists that uh, well, she and her then partner uh, were, you know, were traveling around. They found the monarch colonies. They reported it with National Geographic. And apparently the story goes that this was like one of these uh, very serendipitous things where at the last moment, the photographer asked, you know, why don't we take a couple pictures with um, the, the, sci the citizen scientists who discovered the overwintering grounds, you know, in the, in the colonies. And she did, and that ended up being the, the famous one on the August 1976 cover of National Geographic. Now here I just want to share with you, um, and some of you may have heard this story before, but it, 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 it aligns with that issue of scientists uh, seeking to be objective, but not always being able to for various reasons. Uh, Lincoln Brower and, and Fred Urquhart had been communicating for, I guess, about 12 years before 1976. And 
Brower had been saying the California monarchs, and he knew that Urquhart had been hot on the trail and very close to finding the overwintering grounds with the help of all the citizen scientists. And in their correspondences, um, uh, uh, Urquhart had promised uh, Lincoln that as soon as they found the overwintering grounds, they would uh, let them know of the location so that Brower could go on and conduct his studies of the chemistry and the chemical ecology of the bird predators um, to, to sort of solve that missing piece of the puzzle. Well, Brower kept calling and writing letters and, and Urquhart said, we're close, we're close, we're close. And then finally, August 1976 came around and the National Geographic article came out and uh, Brower called him up and said, hey, what's the deal? Where are they? Can I go? I want to study them. And he said, sorry, we're not going to uh, disclose the location. And he said, you know, look, it's too, it's too precious. There's a conservation issue here. Uh, if we let everybody come to the overwintering colonies, there's not going to be, you know, they might, uh, they might, it's a critical point for the monarchs when we can't let these come. And as you can imagine, that infuriated Brower, and he got one of his uh, 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 most um, uh, precocious undergraduate students, Bill Calvert, to help him in finding the colonies. And they studied the National Geographic article. They're like, okay, we know it's in the highlands of central Mexico, 10,000 feet of elevation, but they just did not give the location. So Calvert went and spent several months um, hiking around, hitchhiking around, looking, and he, and he found the colonies. So in January of 1977, um, Brower and Calvert went together to the overwintering colonies. They were finally going to get to do the studies that they wanted to do. And um, when they got to there, there's 12 common prominent colonies, but when they got to the one main one that they had found, um, Lincoln Brower and <laughs> And Calvert and his team encountered Fred Urquhart in the overwintering colonies. And uh, Brower had the good sense to, um, he handed his camera to his assistant and he said, take a picture of this. <laughs> and I, I call it the confrontation in the colonies in the sense that here we have two of the icons of monarch biology research. They had separate and different research agendas. They weren't competing in particular. Um, but uh, Urquhart didn't want to let Brower know where they were. Brower and his team figured it out. And then there they were uh, in January 77 <laughs> together in the overwintering colonies. All right. Well, the conservation uh, discussion began in 1977. There's a classic New York Times article that both uh, outlined some of the uh, rivalry between Brower and Urquhart. But it also focused on the conservation challenges that uh, I guess that, that we are now really truly experiencing. They anticipated those in the in the in the in the late seventies once the overwintering grounds were found. Uh, and I think you know the overwintering grounds are such a central thing to find to understand that there could be a conservation problem, because on twelve mountaintops the size of New York City, hundreds of millions of butterflies amalgamating from southern Ontario, you know, east of the Rocky Mountains millions of square miles of breeding territory, they're all aggregating on these 12 mountaintops. And that's a pinch point or a bottleneck for the population. So of course, there are various um, conservation challenges noted from uh, habitat loss, logging at the overwintering site. Herbicides were mentioned a lot by, the, by Urquhart in the late 70s. So he was already onto the uh, 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 milkweed getting suppressed by herbicides. Um, and of course, you know, the, the news isn't good, ladies and gentlemen, right? Like uh, this is, this is the, the population trend as estimated by the World Wildlife Foundation. Uh, as probably all of you know, the butterflies are not counted individually in Mexico because there's millions of them. But instead, the area of the forest that is densely covered in butterflies, as you can see in the orange here, is what is estimated. And um, any way you slice it, the population is declining. Uh, the numbers for 2021 were just released, I guess it's been about a month ago, and they're kind of holding steady in this low zone. Um, one of the projects that I've been engaged in, I won't talk a lot about this, but that we're hoping to release some data on pretty soon is going further back before 1994, 1993, 
uh, to try to understand the populations of Mexico. Uh, and the reason that's so critical is in the news, we often hear about 80 and 90% decline. And that's often calculated using this number here or these two kind of very, very high numbers. But it's unclear whether these were typical years in the 80s and the 70s or whether these were anomalously high numbers. So we've actually gone back to Lincoln Brower's uh, some of his unpublished uh, 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 measures of the largest colonies in Mexico back to 1976. And we're hoping to extrapolate the population trends here going uh, uh, to the left between 76 and 93. The one thing I can tell you is that, again, the decline is very real, but whether it's really a 40% decline or whether it's an 80% decline is sort of what we're interested in. And, and we're also interested in knowing how big these fluctuations have been in the past. Uh, just a couple, more, one more slide here. Um, you know, in our own analysis, statistical analysis of the causes of monarch population declines, the break in the annual cycle that we find uh, <clears throat> is getting to the Mexican overwintering sites. In other words, um, by all estimation, populations are declined in Mexico and they're declined in their first generation when they're in Texas and the Gulf states. But when they have three additional generations um, in the North, by all estimates, those populations have increased or rebounded from their low point here in Mexico. And so something seems to happen between, let's say August and March, when they fly south and establish at the overwintering sites that is contributing to their increased decline. So we've hypothesized that nectar sources on the flight down, insecticide use, which can sicken and weaken monarchs, even though we can count them and they're abundant up here, but they may not be able to make it to Mexico. Uh, very little is known about the last 800 miles, although there's many now popped up additional citizen science programs in Northern Mexico and continued degradation at the overwintering grounds are all contributing. Um, hopefully I haven't talked too long. I wanted to thank you uh, for listening and, and hopefully there are a lot of questions and I'd be happy to talk about, about any and all of it. Well, that was absolutely amazing. You told stories that I knew half of, uh, but not all of, and you filled in blanks. Very, very interesting uh, stories and I could relate to a lot of them. That was just awesome. Um, the, when I saw you a couple of years ago in Toronto, you did talk about one third of the monarch caterpillars getting uh, choked by their first bites. And of course I didn't believe it because I've never seen it. And the news got all over the place that one third of the monarchs die uh, when they're caterpillars, when they're, they're first bites. And nobody believed it because everybody in our groups um, raises monarchs 99% of the time on cuttings. And oh, yeah. I imagine, Anurag, that it's the cuttings that don't have the pressure of the milkweed to choke them. Is that correct? Totally correct. Yeah, I mean, it's, I wouldn't even necessarily call it choking. I mean, um, the, they basically drown. So you can imagine, and I, if, um, I'll show you a quick picture. Um, it's a picture I took um, uh, in Southern Ontario. Um, you know, when the monarch eventually takes its first bite, um, depending on how it hits the veins, how it hits the latissifers or the canals that contain latex, um, they may or may not get a very big glob of latex that exudes there. And again, if the, if the leaf is at a bit of an angle, sometimes that latex will, that droplet will dribble, will take the monarch with it and, um, uh, and will essentially kill that monarch dead to the leaf. I'm just going to show you one quick picture here. Okay, I'm actually writing a, another book now with a large section on monarchs, and this is very, very relevant because um, uh, I, I wonder, okay, they drown, do they also, I guess drowning and choking is the same thing, but what about gluing their jaws shut? Is that something that happens? All of it, yeah. So yeah, th here's the picture where the monarch took its first few bites. There was a lot of latex that it, it, it exuded and my take is it carried the monarch uh, away and then it kind of glued the entire animal dead to the leaf here. You know, as, as probably all of you know, um, the latex when it, on, upon exposure to air 
it coagulates. Uh, so very early botanists thought of latex like a plant's blood because they both have this coagulation upon exposure to air. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah, within a minute or two, that uh, matrix starts forming. And certainly uh, one of the things we see tip very commonly is the monarch will get a bunch of latex on its head and it may spend a minute or two getting, its, getting that latex off of its head. And in that time, some of it may uh, coagulate in its mouth parts and uh, make it very difficult to chew, yes. Okay, so all of the above, and now that I'm, uh, now I keep my eyes open in the wild for that happening, and yes, now that I'm aware of it, I actually see it, so that's very, very exciting. Um, I want to ask my uh, one question, and then we're going to open it up to other people's questions, and it's, uh, it's about overwintering, and um, can you confirm to me that the monarchs in, they, they've got to live nine months when a a monarch that doesn't migrate lives one month. So is it because they're in a state of semi-hibernation in Mexico? Okay. Is it, is it, is, is what a, sorry, can you repeat your question? Yes. The monarchs conserve their energy in, they can live nine months because most of them don't mate and they're in a state of semi-hibernation in that cool weather. And that allows them to live longer. That definitely allows them to live longer, absolutely. I would say there might be other or additional physiological changes. Uh, you know, when the monarch gets the, the August-September cues of shortening day lengths, cool nights, and um, tougher milkweed leaves, they, the form that they make that emerges in September is the migratory form that, just as you said, doesn't make bigger wings. Um, and, and so certainly the fact that they're at that kind of 40 to 45 degree temperature in Mexico allows them to persist much longer, but there may be other physiological mechanisms. They may just have a much stronger, sturdier body also that allows them to live that longer period. Well, that's very good to know because it, it, they have to, because with climate change in Mexico, they're much more active the whole season. So, you know, my question was, if they're more active all season, they're going to uh, deplete all their fat stores, and then how are they going to get to Texas? But if there's something else in there uh, that's uh, making them more robust to live longer, that would explain why they're not all dying, uh, why we're not seeing huge die-offs in Mexico after a season with a lot of flight. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the more active, I mean, this is classic Brower research, the more active they are in the winter, uh, the less fat reserves they have. And they have to return about a thousand miles, those same individual butterflies. And so I think we probably are seeing, although we don't know how to quantify it, and will see continued uh, either mortality or lack of the ability to get back to Texas. There's some flexibility there, but I, I do think that that's a real problem, yes. Right, okay, well, then I wanna ask you about the overwintering population in California. It's not, it's not very cold in California. Correct. <laughs> so are they active all, much more active all season, yet they still live their nine months? Well, that's a really good question. Um, you know, when I've been to California, um, I'd say it's, I mean, there are many, many fewer, of course, but um, I don't know, they are very close to the coast. So um, they're not super active when, I, when they're overwintering in those coastal, I've seen them in those coastal parks, you know, on eucalyptus. Um, and when, it, when, it, when the sun is shining on them, yes, they are flying around some, but um, I don't know if it's because they're so close to the water and, and it is somewhat cooler. Um, uh, I don't know also, is their overwintering period as long? It may not be the full four months in California the way it is um, uh, in Mexico, but it's a good question that that temperature differential between the California coast and, and Mexico, um, I'd be interested in, in seeing like an analysis of that. That's interesting. Um, yeah, and humidity is going to help them not uh, dry out at least, um, like in the oil melt. Uh, forests. Um, okay, well, thank you for that. I, uh, I really uh, needed to know that. I want to ask a question now 
um, on behalf of Don Scallon. And he, uh, uh, he asks um, a question about your book. Uh, in Monarchs and Milkweed, you pose this question. Why are the monarchs declining after they are through completing their generations on milkweed? And you note, unfortunately, we don't know the answer yet. And that's page 232. Now, you've kind of just talked about this, but um, is there anything specifically that you've learned in the last four years that helps you better understand that question since the book? Well, I think the, the two pieces of data that have really come out, and this is not my work, but um, work of others, um, there's definitely a greater success rate of, of migration um, in years when there's more summer and fall rain. Um, and we attribute, that's been attributed to nectar resources. The more summer and fall rain there is, especially again in the Texas, Southwest, in the, in the in central, South Central US and Northern Mexico, in that last thousand miles, that nectaring is absolutely critical to fuel their migration and, and, and lipid storage. So the data now exists to show that in years, when there's greater summer and fall precipitation, migratory success is greater. Um, so uh, that's one thing we've learned. Um, there's now just increasing evidence, uh, I mentioned this briefly also, of what we call non-lethal pesticide impacts. So everybody knows that pesticides kill insects, but we've asked the question, you know, if we can count hundreds of millions of butterflies in the north in September, you know, why is it that we're not seeing as many when they arrive to Mexico or overwintering in Mexico? And I think the full pieces have still not been put together yet, but I think what we do now know is that, um, and, it's, and it's an insidious thing, you know, trace levels of insecticides are very low levels that might even be considered acceptable from the EPA's perspective uh, because they're not killing massive numbers of butterflies. If they're sickening them or weakening them such that they can't make the migration, that uh, is likely to be a contributing uh, uh, factor. Yeah, well, speaking of the rains, I know somebody named Craig who would probably um, agree with that. I think he's been saying it for about 50 years that the migration depends on the weather, right, Craig? He's talking, just, just not. Okay, well, thank you for that. That was very informative. And I have a, a, a question on behalf of Ricardo. Uh, he says, here in New York, I have gone into fields covered in acres of common milkweed that's pesticide free and find very few eggs or caterpillars. Yet in my garden, where there are only a few plants, I will find hundreds of eggs every day. Uh, can you explain why these huge fields are not being utilized by monarchs and my side-by-side -side question is, is that you can have two patches of milkweed in very close proximity and one of them has eggs and the other one hasn't. Yeah, I mean, my guess, and, and I guess the little we've studied this um, is that there's different answers for the local scale with two side-by-side -side patches versus um, the larger scale of, uh, you know, giant fields versus home gardens. Um, when it comes to two side-by-side -side patches, my best guess is that um, uh, either the environment, it's a more fertile area for one of them than the other, or the, the clone, as you, as you probably all know, milkweeds are very clonal. Um, they have different genetic makeup in each of the clones. One may simply be more preferred than the other one clone, or may, one may be in a slightly better spot. So when we're studying the defensive traits of the milkweed, you know, we're measuring the amount of latex and um, the amount of cardiac glycosides and the hairiness of the leaves. We find often that clones that are right next to each other may differ in those traits. At the level of, um, <clears throat> of large fields versus home gardens, I think it's a bit, it's a bit more complicated of an answer. Um, the one thing I would say about living in central New York myself in Ithaca, uh, we're not really on the primary flyway of monarchs. So some years or in some patches of, or some fields, we see great numbers in other places, other times not. And I think there's other locations. And if you look at the website Journey North, you can kind of see the primary flyways. 
um, there are other places where it's just much more reliable um, that monarchs, if there's a big field, will be there um, or not. Home gardens, I think, are really interesting in part because I think once butterflies make it into a neighborhood um, with a lot of sidewalks and macadam and cars and houses, um, you know, they may spend many days in that location. And so when they find an isolated patch of milkweed, especially one that's been weeded around that may be getting some fertilizer or whatever, that monarch may be quite desperate and may lay many, many eggs on an individual plant. Um, so probably most of you know, or many of you know that individual monarch butterfly tends to avoid plants that have even one single egg on it already. They can smell it. So um, in natural field populations, if you survey, you know, a thousand stems, um, uh, you know, the of the stems that have eggs, most will have one egg, some will have two, and there'll be precious few that have more than that. And that, that work was done by uh, Susanna Borkin, I think, in the early 80s, but other people have, have confirmed it. Monarchs avoid plants even with one single egg on them. And the reason is pretty is pretty clear. I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, monarch butterfly caterpillars are, are cannibalistic, but on, the only form of cannibalism is that a caterpillar will eat an egg. Um, caterpillars don't eat each other. They don't eat pupae or chrysalids, or chrysalids or anything else. But if you have two eggs on a leaf and one hatches one day before the other, one of the first things that that hatched caterpillar does is it goes and it eats that other egg. Um, and there's a whole bunch, you know, we could talk a lot about that. I mean, that probably is avoiding competition, right? I mean, um, but, but um, sorry, I've been rambling now. So, the, so the, the, you know, they avoid, so I think when we get tens or hundreds of eggs on a single plant, that tends to indicate a desperate butterfly. Uh, and I think we tend to see more desperate butterflies in more established neighborhoods where um, there may be relatively less milkweed available. Oh my goodness, I am so learning so much. I, I'm, I'm sorry that you guys are looking at the top of my head as I take so many notes. Um, the next person to ask a question is Nancy. Nancy, are you there and can you un unmute? Nancy has unmuted. Okay, go ahead. Let's hear your question. Well, Nancy, you've unmuted, but we still can't hear your question. So Lynn, you need to unmute and you can ask your question and uh, put your hand up with the little yellow hand if, if you also have a question. Yes, I do. I'm so thrilled to be able to ask you this. Um, welcome. Um, I started out in 1992. So when my book, Mark Magic came out, the population was so big. And I've, you've watched this, we've all watched this over these almost 25 years now. And it's just continually gone down. How, what do you see as the key maybe to, to maybe turning this thing around to finally making it so that um, it will it will start upward again. I mean, it was so huge when we all started out. It was joyous, and and now it's it's scary to see that these precious, beautiful creatures could you know continue on a downward. But they don't seem they seem to to hold strong. But how do you see the future of this? Well, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic and I guess I'm a little, not embarrassed, but I'm, I'm sort of a little reluctant to share my actual personal views about this. But I mean, I think, you know, humanity or American society or North American society, you know, we're willing to kind of do the little things, uh, but we're not really willing to do the big things. The real, we're not willing to really legislate and we're not really willing to, um, uh, uh, you know, put the brakes on the toxicants and the the toxicants in the environment. We're not really willing to um, protect twenty percent of the land as wildlands. I mean, I think that fundamentally, um, for conservation of species, uh, with the level of inputs and pesticides and uh, fragmentation that we've 
uh, imposed, um, it just takes, you know, it takes real teeth in terms of uh, not doing the little things. Of course, we should all recycle. Um, but I think what we're very, very good at is um, making ourselves feel good by recycling, buying a Prius or whatever, but not really willing to do um, the hard things societally. And, and I understand the, the conflicts and the, uh, and the reasons for that. But um, the one thing I guess I'd say is that, you know, monarchs are probably um, a poor conservation model. Uh, it's a, they are a very robust somewhat weedy species. You know, monarchs have been introduced and have self-sustaining populations in Hawaii, in Spain, in Australia. If they have new migratory routes they use in, in, in the South Pacific, they don't migrate in Spain. I mean, so um, probably, you know, monarchs are gonna be fine no matter what. But um, the more important question I think is that you, they've captured our attention because they're amazing and they're beautiful and they're abundant during the daytime and we can observe them, we can rear them. But um, for every monarch there's, um, you know, as a species, there are many, many other uh, species that are much more fragile, right? That um, whose population sizes are small, their geographic ranges are small, uh, they're being threatened much more directly. Um, and, and those are the ones I think that, um, uh, you know, we're definitely losing on a yearly basis. But I'm not that optimistic, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> okay, then we're going to take a few quick questions from uh, Lori, Nancy, and Marion, and then we'll go to announcements. So if uh, Lori, Nancy, and Marion can unmute and ask your questions succinctly, go ahead, Lori. Hi, um, I read your book two summers ago. It was my summer reading at the pool as I was collecting monarchs from the pool area and bringing them home to raise. Since then, um, and I raised hundreds that summer. Um, I'm, my question is basically this, I'm a teacher by the way, um, and I teach elementary school kids and teach them, uh, first graders show the life cycle. So we go into the milkweed that I planted in my schoolyard and we raise. Um, but I only raise a few in a classroom because now I feel it's more important that the environment does it themselves and I've changed my whole view. I was wondering what your thoughts are on the hand raising because that's a very popular thing. Um, I'm not sure if you follow all of that craziness sure. on Facebook, but I'm curious, like for me, I raised 400 that summer and that was insanity. It was all me. And, and then I showed my kids how, and, and I do workshops with my students. And then I do it with the community just to explain to them how it all works. But I don't, my personal feeling is let nature take its course, though the numbers are so low. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. I agree with you. I know there's a lot of disagreement, certainly among the people that are, that are on this, uh, on this meeting. Um, my view is that um, we should raise a couple and we should raise it to watch the magic. We should, you know, to sort of inform ourselves, to inspire ourselves. Um, uh, and I think the reasons not to, to rear many or mass rear are fall into kind of two categories for me. One are the potential dangers of en enhancing disease and uh, increasing other issues, which, um, you know, one can, if they uh, take great, great care, avoid. Um, but often we don't. Um, as one example, I think uh, some unpublished data has shown that um, OE has increased in the population of monarchs. And uh, this is maybe is published in North America from 1% to 18% uh, over the last 20 years. And, um, you know, that's pretty darn alarming. And people have speculations about to what extent re home rearing is causing that kind of uh, increase. We don't know the answer. The other reason that I am not an advocate of, of mass home rearing, and again, I, I understand the differences here. And I, we shouldn't get into a debate, but I would just, I think it's, um, I understand completely the desire to help. I wanna help, um, but um, I, you know, the grandness of the problem and of the scale of monarchs means that um, two things, it's unlikely that we'll really be able to help, that we'll really be able to help by mass rearing at a scale that will improve the population. And in addition, I sometimes view the monarch population as like a sink that has filled with water and that's, that's 
that's draining. And so what rearing does is it adds more water into the sink. It sort of says, well, okay, maybe if we add enough, um, you know, we can keep the sink from draining. But you're not addressing the leak in that case. You're not addressing the water flushing down the tube that, you know, is presumably caused by these environmental problems that we're talking about. So um, I want to help, you know, uh, but I'm just not convinced that um, rearing, and especially rearing one species, monarchs themselves are are, are not important species. They're they're important uh, for us as icons, as symbols of nature, uh, but they are one of the 10 million. Uh, species on the planet. And um, as I said earlier, many others are suffering much greater consequences. So we need to protect habitat. And um, But uh, yeah, sorry to ramble on. <laughs> I, I appreciate that answer. And, and that's my takeaway for my... The... Um, uh, thank you, Laurie. Um, I've uh, promised Clement he can ask a question. So um, uh, go ahead, Clement. Thank you. Um, Anil, You're a I'm, scientist. I'm a population geneticist, and um, I know that with the monarch genome available, if you sequence enough monarchs in detail, you can use population genetic techniques to infer past effective population sizes. Do you think this is the way to getting at where they were 50 or 100 years ago? Yeah, great question. There's a manuscript circulating right now. I'm not an author on it, and I guess because it's not through the review process, I shouldn't reveal uh, who the authors are, but they have done that. They've deeply sequenced a whole bunch of butterflies, I think from the 70s and then currently and measured effective population sizes. And as far as that study is concerned, monarch population, effective population sizes increased in the last uh, 30, 40 years. Um, now there's a big issue there of between like the number of butterflies that we see and how genetically diverse they are that sort of complicated stuff that obviously you're familiar with, but I would say that the genetic and genomic information I'm familiar with that's just ready to surface is that uh, the declines are not what they appear from the Mexico data. Well, I'll be looking for that paper, thanks. Okay, thank you for that uh, good question, Clement. And uh, uh, Karen and Steve, go ahead. Thanks, Carol. Um, Carol, I just wanted to thank you so much for giving us this wonderful opportunity to uh, speak with Dr. Agrawal this evening. Uh, it's been a real treat. Uh, we love your book. And we wanted to introduce ourselves. We're Karen and Steve McCurdy. We're the, co -past, uh, pres uh, the past co-presidents of the Butterfly Society of Virginia. We're the couple who have been communicating with you about speaking. Uh, our current president, Maurice Cullen, is also on this meeting. And all of us want to tell you again how very much we are looking forward to scheduling you to speak once we can go back to um, having our meetings in person. So just wanted to have a chance to see, to, for you to see our faces and actually uh, introduce ourselves. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Yeah, nice to see you. Well, that's very, that's very exciting. And as always, uh, Anurag, you will be wined and dined when you get there. Um, uh, as they did for uh, me and a few others. Um, yeah, uh, and I'm sure Don, whoever he is, did that in Toronto. Um, so we've got uh, Marion. Did you, Marion, you've got a question. Hi, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I just wanted to, um, as an aside to say how much I love your photography as well. And um, I have routinely painted the beautiful butterfly monarch that was on uh, head of your science article a few years ago. I've made masks like silk masks with a butterfly on them using that, that photo. They're just gorgeous. Um, but I, uh, I'm a master's student studying uh, in plant science, studying the distribution of uh, monarch reproduction uh, preferences in Eastern Ontario. And uh, I did a field survey in 2019. And there was a, especially in the area that we've sort of identified as a hotspot, there was, you could, I could follow the path of uh, Russian milkweed, dog strangling vine, uh, Russ Vincic Toxicum Russicarium. Um, and 
you know, I was tearing my hair out by the end of it and I wasn't sure. And I have kind of since then gone, okay, how much of a problem is this? What is the word on this? And it, it didn't, I didn't, I haven't seen a lot of literature so far about, you know, there, there's the possibility that it's a sink for monarchs, but I didn't see any eggs or any caterpillars on it, which could mean they'd already died. But I'm, so I'm just wondering where that is now and, and um, you know, how much I should be trying to uh, inform people about the concerns. My take is that, um, that dog strangling vine or vincitoxicum is, um, its greatest, neg its biggest negative impact is not on milkweeds or monarch or monarch interactions, but more just on choking out particular fields um, of, of, of you know, anything that's there. Um, I'd agree with you that I've looked at a lot of um, uh, plants and not found eggs. I've put monarchs in large cages with vincitoxicum and haven't been able to convince them to lay eggs. Um, there's certainly those two publications, and I believe them that under some circumstances, monarchs will lay an egg on vincitoxicum, but um, I would guess that it's not a really big sink um, for them. So, um, but you know, it's interesting until you see a, an acre that's just completely vincitoxicum, you don't really realize what a big uh, nuisance it can be. And I think like many invasive weeds, it's sort of just has the potential to really just change the ecosystem at that scale. So um, there are many yeah, it reasons. Was that... taking out, it was taking out, you know, areas where had been previous, like, cause I used to just the science data. So where there had been recordings of hundreds of monarchs, um, you were lucky if you even found a single milkweed, right? It was, uh, it, it was, it was, it was disturbing. <laughs> yes, and it's a disaster in Toronto. Uh, it's just monoculture all over and whatever milkweed we have left is just crowded uh, right out. So we're going to have a, a thank you for the question and for the answer. Uh, we're going to have some announcements and I get to start. And then Ricardo, if you like, you can tell us uh, quickly about your group. And what's my announcement? It's about the next Zoom. It's about the next Zoom. So let's see if I can actually, if this is going to work, uh, put the link, no. Uh, anyway, I want you to come to the next Zoom. It's going to be completely different again. We're going to be talking about spirituality of butterflies and the author you may not have heard of. So this is going to be completely, completely new. And her name is Phyllis Calvi. And she has written a book called The Butterfly Club, Is That You? And she's collected dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds of stories of people who have had spiritual experiences with butterflies. So this is a place to bring your spiritual experience or hear about others. She's also spoken far and wide and, and because the book is not new. And wherever she speaks, people are lined up to tell her about their spiritual experiences of meeting um, their departed loved ones through a butterfly. So that'll be completely different and I'd love to see you there. Um, you'll go to, um, um, well, I'm going to type it in there. Um, I'm going to type it in there while Ricardo's telling us about uh, his place. Um, I think I might be able to get it in there. Otherwise I'm going to have to tell it to you. Okay, Ricardo, did you want to unmute and make an announcement? Uh, hope I did it right. <laughs> Oh, there you are. Oh, oh, I forgot. There are two prizes today, which are just symbolic prizes for um, best theme. Okay, three. And that will be, um, I had it before Karen joined us today. It will be Karen for her monarch butterfly background, Ricardo for his uh, blanket or scarf, and also oh. Laurel for her background of looking like students doing something with monarchs. So thank you for coming in theme. And uh, Ricardo, tell us about your group. Okay, well, my group is fairly new. Uh, it's only about a year and a half old. Um, it's a lengthy title. It's uh, Fundraising Monarchs and Danius Butterflies, a Learning Global Experience. Um, we're growing at a phenomenal rate and we try very hard to first and foremost get people to establish butterfly gardens before they ever even consider trying to do any raising 
of butterflies. And the whole point is to rear them so that we get big, healthy, strong butterflies. Um, I personally have been working with Chip Taylor. I weigh and measure all my monarchs from the beginning of the season right to the end of migration. And I've been told that they are, every single one of them, large migrating monarchs. So, and I, as of now, I've got like over 1200 butterflies raised. I also have compiled two books too. I, I know Carol was concerned that I should mention that. Um, one dealing with native um, plants, both milkweed and nectar plants. And the other is about um, the rearing methodologies and rearing monarchs, predators, parasites, pathogens, all, all the ins and outs. So. so you need to go to uh, Ricardo's group and uh, there you can get his free download of his 900 page book and the, um, the butterfly, the uh, Facebook page is called what Ricardo? It's called Fun Raising Monarchs and Danius Butterflies a learning experience globally. Maybe I should type it into the chat. That would be a, a great idea. And anybody <laughs> else who has a relevant link, type that into the chat. And is, does anybody else um, have an announcement? Um, Holly, are you still there? Okay, we lost Holly. Um, I'm, here, I'm here. Oh, Holly. I so, remembered. Oh, Holly, it's great to see you. Um, uh, can you uh, invite people to your absolutely phenomenal, fantastic uh, Facebook uh, group, which I'm mentioning in my upcoming book? The Beautiful Monarch. Um, we're about 40,000 members. 40,000 members. <laughs> in, case, in case you didn't hear that clearly, there's 40,000. And growing quickly. Oh, quickly. Um, we just started that new uh, group thing with Facebook yesterday. So we're hoping that goes smoothly. I want to stay public because that's the only way that I can share photos with other groups or um, information. If somebody wants to take it and add it to their group, they can do it. So I'm trying to stay away from going private. So I have to go along with this new change that they're doing to all the groups. Yes, it's very complicated. And how many people do you have uh, helping you run the group, Holly? Um, oh, goodness. Uh, about a dozen. I, I didn't a dozen. It, it takes a dozen administrators just to, to answer the questions more. because the group is primarily for newbies and there's an unlimited number of people all the time who are getting into it. And these 12 moderators, along with other people, uh, nurse the, and literally um, nurse them along. So I am going, is there any other, uh, are there any other announcements? I'm going to thank our speaker. We're, uh, we just, it was just a terrific experience. I'm going to have to watch the whole thing again because there were so many things uh, that I learned. There's always something new to learn about monarchs, eh? Um, this is so much fun. So uh, thank you for, for that. And um, we're now uh, allowing you to go if you'd like. And then we stay around uh, for a social. Hey, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for coming. I really enjoyed talking with you guys. Thank you. Okay, bye. Okay, so everybody else who wants to leave can leave. And uh, then the rest of us will, um, we'll, we, we'll, we'll go on gallery view. I'm gonna go on gallery so I can see everybody. Gallery and... Um, so what did you think? Was that like awesome or oh, incredible or what? Wonderful. What did you, oh, Bev is waving at me. Okay, you get extra points for that, Bev. <laughs> okay, stop.